Hello, it's Ren Presents Time. I'm your host, Ren, and today we continue with the House of Bloodstein, Mentralysis, Part 3, Chapter 2. I am Chrysania. In our last chapter, we hooked up with Lord Philip of Blanchford and his new bride, Thomasina of Blanchford, formerly Thomasina the 19th of Wham. They had a lope and made their way to the resort town of Fazo on Onaris, which is a, a popular beach area, hanging out under an alias, enjoying the quiet sea life and so forth, until after having a gamed up dream, Magistrate Kylos dreamt where they were and told Sarah. And then after getting locked out of the Baznet, Sarah homed in on them and rousted them to action. And they are now on their way at the behest of Magistrate Kylos who risked her life to do a second gaming session so that they could locate the Chadburn, which they assume to be the control column of Queen Gome's Balor chest monster. And they are on their way to try to acquire this item. And according to the Magistrate's second gaming session dream, their starting place is Castle Bloodstein. And then she told them to beware because the castle is empty except for demons that serve Queen Gome and that these demons are pretty horrible. So as the last chapter ended, Philip landed the goshawk in the howling snow, and our quest for the Chadburn was ready to commence. I mentioned I had written my big old ass into a corner. As I finished the initial drafts of this story, I handed it off to a couple of beta readers just to give it a look-see, see if anything pops up that I might have missed or things didn't make sense. That's a common thing with authors. They roll it out to a couple people, see what they think, and then make adjustments if if need be. Well, the beta tester said, hey, these demons working for Queen Gome are pretty wimpy. They're sissies. You need to beef them up. Sissies? Have you been drinking? These monsters are awesome. But they insisted. No, they're just not tough enough. Okay, fine. I will toughen them up. And I did. I proceeded to do so. And I made them too freaking tough. I'm like, Philip, with his Poltava and his those Capricos weapon, isn't gonna do much good against a bunch of these demons and then his wife Thomasina doesn't even have a gun she carries her Mount Calm club which is it's just a club and you bonk somebody on the head and it mystically knocks them out so Philip has his Poltava a gun with 25 shots and his sap which is uh like a scar, like a piece of fabric that he can form in, by the power of his mind into you know, shields, weapons, that sort of thing. And Thomasina has her Mount Calm Club, and that that's it. And these two aren't going to make it. So I had to take drastic action, and I had to finagle things appropriately in order to give them a, some sort of a fighting chance in the horrors that are to come. So we'll see if you can determine what it was I had to do to fix the problem I had created for myself. Also in writing this chapter, the development of these characters is an ongoing process. You think you have them all fleshed out in your head when you start, but then you change your mind, or they, they evolve with the story in unexpected ways sometimes, and such is the case here. And I found myself emotionally and Invested in my own writing, I found myself saddened by some of the revelations that will happen in this chapter. We'll see if it comes through, if, it, if you can pick up on that. At the end of the reading, I'll give you my thoughts, but see what, see what you think. Anywho, let's proceed, shall we? Part 3, Chapter 2, I Am Chrysania. Philip shut the goshawk down, the interior of the ship going dark. The northern wind knocked on the hatch door and howled across the cockpit glass, dusting it in pearls of snow. Keep the engines running so I can stay connected, Sarah said. Unhook the Dash 6 transponder and take it with you. I'm going to see if I can tap into the castle's grid if it's still operating. Give 
Give me a sec. Philip pulled the transponder and placed it in his duster. You still with me, Sarah? Yep. Came her voice from within, slightly muffled. He reloaded his Poltava and slipped it into his duster pocket. Thomasina stared out the glass at the dark, crab-like edifice of Castle Bloodstein towering ahead, as black as the snow was white. The driving snow and lightless towers of the castle gave one the impression of fathomless isolation. Dislike this place intensely, Philip. It has a dreadful feel. Feels as if we're the only people within a thousand miles. You probably are, Sarah replied. Philip draped two sap scarves around his neck. It's just an old castle, just like Xandar and Clovis. Cana has its fair share of ruins. Sarah even said it's abandoned. And what of Queen Gome's demons, the Manx? What of them? They're not on the surface, Sarah said from the transponder in Philip's pocket. Should we release the whispers? Thomasina asked. It couldn't hurt, Sarah replied. Thomasina opened her locket. Two whispers, one pink, the other a soft teal, came buzzing out and slowly orbited her head in a concentric spiral. They're released, Thomasina said, catching them in the palm of her hand. I'm very fond of these two. They were a gift from Philip's mother. I named the pink one Bridgewater and the teal Inn after the place we spent our honeymoon. Lovely, Sarah said. She can always make you more, you know. There are the only two of them, and the more whispers you have, the better they work. But these two should grant you basic sight, sound, and visibility. Any little bit helps. Are you making any progress with the castle systems? Philip asked. No, Sarah replied flatly. Just give me a few minutes. Their systems are trash. It's like talking to a turnip. Thomasina gasped and pointed out the glass. Philip, I see a light just there. Do you see it? Far off through the gloom and the veils of snow, a soft orb of silver light gleamed, dim but steady and inviting. What's that light? She asked. Philip stared at it. I don't know. We're whisper locked. We're armed. Let's get this over with. The whispers buzzing and weapons ready. Philip opened the hatch. Freezing air and tendrils of snow barged in. They stepped out into the cold, the snow riding up their boots, spilling into the courtyard, following the nebulous ball of silver light in the distance. What a depressing place, Thomasina said, noting the low-hanging gray skies and bare gothic stone blackened with age. She clutched her cloak around her. Philip, with his vif stock, was impervious to the cold, while Thomasina, a zaffin of old Barrow heritage, from the temperate city of Wham, was certainly not. She shivered. Water locked in frozen channels cracked beneath their feet. Landscaping and statuary were covered in ice. Sarah, you still with us? Philip asked. Yep, I'm duking it out with the castle here. I think I've got the system knocked. Just another minute or two. We're investigating the silver light. Seems to be located in the central courtyard. Be careful. Thomasina's teeth chattered in the cold. She admitted Philip into her cloak to warm her. Saffin's beard. I miss warm Fazo. My barrel blood does not favor this cold. I don't like this elder down place one bit. History teaches us the Bloodsteins once attacked Barrow and laid waste to Saga. The Bloodsteins used to attack everybody, Philip said. The silver light came into focus. Perched on a stone bench by a frozen pond, where Lady Crisania herself once sat, was a small silver bird, glowing with warm light, fluffing his feathers. He took no notice of them. Is that King? Thomasina said. Philip was overjoyed. It sure is. Sarah, it's King. He's here waiting for us. He's probably his old dour self as always. What did I tell you? King's a champ. You'll need to let him into the Whisper's Veil so we can hear and see you, Sarah said. What's the password? Mr. and Mrs. Illibuck, Philip replied. Really? Sarah asked as the veil opened. She favored more heroic passwords. King! Philip cried, lowering his potava. It's good to see you. What are you doing here? I turned away and King responded. I knew you would soon arrive, so I came from Hoban and waited. That's cool, Sarah said. Great job dropping off the chest to Raw and his boys. Did you have any trouble? I did not. I visited your capsule for a bit while I was there, Lady Sarah. Yeah? How was I? Quiet, hairless, faceless, asleep. I'm 
must be a looker. Indeed. Thomasina curtsied to King. Well met, great bird. We value and appreciate your presence. King fluffed his feathers in response. Thomasina rubbed her eyes, the cold making them water. So, here we are standing in the freezing cold. What's next? We're gonna have to get you a snugs or something, Thomasina, Sarah said over the transponder. It's cold in this land. Better get used to it. Where are we supposed to go? Sarah answered. Down below the surface into the Gellertron. I'm hacking in to activate the castle systems. There was a frustrated pause. What the heck sort of ridiculous language are they speaking? It's probably this, Sarah, Philip replied. Nope. Ultra Sarah can speak Vith. What do you think about that, eh? She replied in perfect Vith. Hold on. As they waited, Philip noticed a pair of delicate footprints in the ice in front of the bench. Perfect, delicate feet. Those are Lady Crisania's footprints, he said, nostalgic. She sat right over there, fully repaired and glowing with good health after her trip to the top of the universe. How she smiled. I was so happy for her. I was proud to have assisted in restoring her health. He shook his head. All of it a lie. You couldn't have known, Philip, Thomasina said. You and your cousins are good people. I heard that. Thanks, Thomasina, Sarah cried. Around them, lights came on in a soft white dash-dash glow at the perimeter of the courtyard. I got the power going, Sarah cried. Ha! Ah, what I tell you? Ultra Sarah can do. Follow the lights. Let's go. What about Gomes Manx? Philip asked. Whisper lock, so that should give you some protection. And Kai said they're not on the surface. Don't worry about them for now. But when they do show up, King knows what to do with them. Right, King? He took flight and landed on Philip's shoulder. He didn't reply. They went inside the castle, seeing the ruins within. The torn cloth and rotting furniture turned over in the dark, freezing within towering runs of old stone. What a forlorn place, Thomasina said, holding her Mount Calm club. Seems no one has lived here in centuries. She shuddered under her cloak. It's just as freezing inside as it is out there in the snow. The main Bloodstein household relocated to a remote planet on the other side of the League a few centuries back, leaving the castle here pretty much abandoned. Philip said. The castle did look a little bit more livable when we were here last. We might have been seeing a painted cloak. That must be the case. A string of lights came on overhead, leading them into the dank interior of the castle. The place seemed vacant and sad, permeated with drifting shadows and old memories. Come on, Sarah said from Philip's duster. What's taking so long? May we switch her off, please? Thomasina asked. Don't you dare, Sarah replied. We're family now, remember? They entered the area where they had seen Lady Crisania previously. The large oaken door was heavy in its stone frame. Close tight. Alert, King cried. A robed, hooded figure leaning against the wall appeared in the fringes of King's light. King fluttered over the figure and lit it up in his cones. It was Lady Crisania's servant, the one they had seen several times in their previous visits to the castle. The figure seemed crumpled up. It didn't move. Philip marked marched up and pulled the figure's hood back, revealing a rudimentary, vaguely human head made of contoured metal struts and tautly strung wire. Philip stepped back in shock. It's an analog, he cried, pulling the robe away from its body. Inside were an assemblage of struts, well-made pulleys, and cable innards. It had a gear pack mounted in the chest area for inserting simple, pre-programmed cartridge controllers. Its head consisted of nothing more than wire mesh, fiber bundles, and a voice tube. What is this? Thomasina asked, poking around with her mount calm, seeing the skeletal wire and cog workings. It's an analog mannequin, Philip said. Just a simple automaton that can perform a few pre-programmed movements from a cartridge. This one has a voice tube, so a remote operator can speak for it. Philip thought a moment. I wonder who it was we were speaking to then. Probably Queen Go herself or one of the Jones, Sarah said. Okay, let's move on. Philip pushed the analog aside and tried the oaken door. Lady Crisania's gallery is through here. It's locked. Come on, muscles. Get that door open, Sarah chided. I'd have it open by now. Thomasina tried it and also couldn't budge it. Philip checked the mannequin for keys but found none. Where's Sam when we need her? Flat on her back in Hoban without a face just down the way from where I am. Fighting pirates, Sarah replied. All right, step back. King, take 
take out this door. Philip and Thomasina backed up and King hovered up, scanning the door for weak areas. Back up a bit farther, he said. They took a few more steps back. Satisfied, King accelerated fast, flying through the wooden door like a bullet, leaving a round splintery hole in his wake. He crashed back out a moment later, knocking the lock off. Gripping the door with his tiny feet, he swung it open. Great job, King. We're in, Philip said. Ha ha, boy, King. Sarah cried, approving of the damage he could do. Inside was a narrow corridor of inky darkness, heading down at a slight angle. King flew forward, the sweaty cave-like stone glistening in his light. Philip added his own sight. They moved down the corridor and came up to a felt curtain draped across the threshold. Philip pulled a sap from his neck, formed it to a sword, and sliced it down the center. Beyond, the open gallery room was bathed in dim, humid light. Light, dusted with frost, the gallery previously basked in total darkness. The windows and skylights blacked out, but now the windows were open, the panes swinging in the chill breeze, admitting a trickle of gray light. To the right of the threshold was the statue of a menacing dragon-like beast. King fluttered around and inspected it as a possible threat. That's our boy, Sarah said. That's an image of Queen Gome's bower chest. That's what we're up against, people. If we don't put it out of action, it's going to be using Kay and the Hightaft's dead bodies as a pillow. According to Kai, it's a pretty rough customer. Thomasina looked it over and gave it a thump with her mount calm. Now according to Kai, this next bit is going to be pretty weird. As if it isn't already weird, Thomasina replied. According to Kai, we need to look around for a message from Lady Chrysania herself, Sarah said. A message from the one who lied to you? Thomasina asked. That was Gom, not Chrysania, Sarah replied. Gom used Chrysania to hide behind, to feed us information, to keep us in the dark and provide a credible brainscape in case we tried to stare her for the truth, like we did with the oculum that third time out. So Chrysania left us a message. Let's find it. They checked over the gallery, not quite certain what they were looking for. On the other side of the room was the grand old table where they had dined with Lady Chrysania. The floor around the table was messy with old food, discarded goblets and plates, as if they had been swept from the tabletop and allowed to clatter to the floor. The surface of the table was empty save for one odd thing, an assemblage of twisted silver and gleaming linkages sitting in the center of the table like a loaf of bread. Philip picked it up. It was a finely crafted silver gauntlet made to fit over a slender arm, bewilderingly intricate and lightweight, yet strong and durable. At the end of the gauntlet was an automated hand, studded with long and possibly sharp-looking claws made to kill. Holding the gauntlet, he looked at the tabletop, old and strong, stained in deep red, probably used by the Bloodsteins for centuries. He remembered Kay had seen a bit of juvenile vandalism carved into the wood by the deplorable Wonderlux during their previous visit. There it was, crudely scratched into the ancient surface. The Wonderlux were here. However, a new message was cut into the very wood of the tabletop, over the graffiti, carved with a fragile, delicate female script and leaving a litter of curled wood shavings across the top. Philip brushed the curls aside. Rose, this must be Lady Chrysania's message, he said as Thomasina came in to look. She didn't have hands, so she must have worn this gauntlet and carved the letters. Read it to me, Sarah said. It says, I am Chrysania. You see what a sorry wretch I am, not only for the terrible infirmity foisted upon me, but for the gullibility and poor choices I've made over the centuries. Long ago, I was a daughter of Bloodstein. I married, had children, had grandchildren, and I watched them all live their lives and die while I continued on, my tomb forever unoccupied. What was wrong with me? I went to the sisters for help, and I suffered for decades in Valenhelm, a prisoner of the sisters. They didn't bother to lock my cell door, for I was so weak and compliant. I was so afraid, I simply sat there and allowed them to 
torture me. Simple Chrysania, frightened Chrysania, an immortal freak and plaything of the sisters. My house, fearing the sisters' wrath, abandoned me as an oddity, pronouncing me dead, holding vigil over an empty tomb. As I wept in my bed, I begged for someone to help me, to comfort me, to correct all my problems. From the depths of my dreams, my prayers were answered. Gome came, speaking to me in the night, approaching across the river of sanity, promising to do all I asked. I listened, I took heart, and Valenhelm, I gave her my body, and then she imprisoned me, just as the sisters had done, though like a fool, I continued to listen to her promises. I'm sorry I'm not stronger. I'm sorry I keep listening to lies, hoping they're the truth. When I returned from the top of the universe, you saw me, healthy and whole, the happiest I had been in such a long time, and you shared that moment with me. I wasn't dead to you. I was alive. Afterwards, I was put back in the dark again, my beautiful new face torn away by the beast in the dark like it was nothing, like it was worthless trash, just like me. Now before she returns to claim my blank body and decorate it in fresh travesty stolen from a tainted earth, I wish to offer you a gift. You helped me before, and now I want to help you. The great bower chest. I saw what she's done to it, how she uses it to oppress, uses it to kill. The bower chest was a thing of wonder, a thing of riches, so patient, so strong. I was there with my brothers and sisters when our house built it. I remember how sunny and warm it was that summer. The castle so vibrant, thriving with life and possibilities, fluttering with bloodstained banners. I remember the hammering, the shower of sparks, the smelting, the sun glittering off its brand new scales as they were lifted into place. We walked amongst the craftsmen, offering them water to slake their thirst as they labored. I recall the thrill we had going inside for our first ride, feeling its arcane heart beating. My father lifted me with his strong hands and I set the control column to fly and away we went soaring into the sky we all laughed with joy how we laughed now the bower chest I so love serves her an unkind hammer bearing stolen treasure taken from murdered hands and I finally understand the voice in my dreams was right how long it took me to see it that I had surrendered my soul to a monster turning the things I loved my family loved to evil she removed the controlling column from the bower chest centuries ago when the brotherhood of the murdered queen attempted to capture it and set it aside to be melted down. I and my brothers and sisters helped assemble that column. It was our contribution to the bower chest making and it's, it's all I have left of them. I couldn't let it go when she wasn't watching. Some little bit of defiance rose up in me. I stole the column and hid it deep within the Gellertron. I took it a piece of the column and enchanted it to serve as a lantern to guide you faithful to it. The piece is nearby. I'm hopeful. With your skills, you will locate it. It will lead you through the Gellertron to the column. Take it and be safe. Give our bower chest a second chance to be what it was intended. A thing of wonder, not of evil. And perhaps, after so long and so much has been done, I finally place my faith in those worthy of it. I pray this message finds you. Know this, my face can shield you against her creatures. Let it help you as best it can. You are my champion. Do not be killed by the things I love. I would beg a favor, though I I do not deserve it. Bury my body. Chrysania, former heiress of Mog and Bloodstein, last of my line. Philip and Thomasina stood there silent. Sarah spoke over the transponder. You know, call me a sap, but I really feel sorry for Lady Chrysania. Philip looked at the metal gauntlet studded with a clawed hand, a savage creation of Queen Gome, used by a desperate woman crying out for help. He too pitied her. And you believe she can be trusted? King asked. Philip answered. I read her words and I feel her sorrow. We have to help her. Thomasina looked around the forlorn room. But where is it? What are we looking for? Sarah, does Kai say where to look? 
know, but she says we need the part Chrysania hid. We won't locate the Chadburn without it. She mentioned the part was nearby. It must be in the gallery somewhere, Philip said. They spread out, checking everywhere they could think of, moving furniture, searching the dark corners, finding nothing but mold and grit. King, you got anything? Philip asked. I do not, he said. Tomasino wandered over to the far side of the room, passing the bower chest statue. Philip watched her and had a thought. Rose, Lady Chrysania spent a fair amount of time talking about the bower chest and how it meant a great deal to her. I wonder... He went to the statue of the bower chest, placed near the entrance to the gallery. Tomasina and King joined him. He lit his sight. I think this might be hollow. They searched the surface. What are you doing? Sarah asked. Give me an update. We're checking the statue to see if it opens. Well, hurry it up. I should be there. I'm better at finding secret levers than you are. Eventually, they located a hidden button within the statue's breastplate. The breastplate of the statue opened, moving aside to reveal a cavity. A plain brown box the size of a hat box was situated inside. The box was manila brown in color, constructed of sturdy cardboard. Philip pulled it out, feeling its considerable weight, and returned to the table. Inside, wrapped up in thick beige paper, was an ornate brass handle splendid with engraved twisting ivy and wrought flowers. It shuddered slightly in his grasp. This must be the handle for the Chadburn, Philip said. He turned it over in his hands, inspecting it closely. I see a number of names etched into the brass. I see Pharonald, Seth, Tyvonia, Mistriel, Rantine, all names I recall from the antiquity of Bloodstein. I think Lord Pharonald went on to found planet Budstein. Oh, look! Look here! I see the name Chrysania mixed in as well. He handed it to Thomasina and she gave it a close inspection. She saw the names all etched into the handle with an energetic hand. Why is it moving? She asked, feeling the handle bump about in her grasp. You read the note. Cassania put a bloodstained spell on it, Sarah said. King landed on the rim of the box and gazed into the interior. I am detecting organic material. Philip reached into the box. It was full of thick beige paper. Wait, Rose, this isn't paper in the box. He pulled out a limp face draped in golden hair. It was Chrysania's face that he had seen as she returned from the top of the universe. It was soiled with filth as if it had been put out in the cold and left to rot. Underneath were the rest of her parts, hands, feet, etc. Philip laid the parts out on the table in rough proper order from top to bottom. They all appeared to be there. They stood there staring at the parts of Lady Chrysania, a grotesque, deflated, unwhole amalgam, silent and desperate, crying out out for help. Philip felt a wave of emotion course through him. He felt for this poor woman. He spoke to her disembodied face and held her unmoving hand. We have come, Lady Chrysania. After all this time, after all that has been said and done, we have heard you at last. You are not trash, and you are not worthless. He took his sap and formed it into a sword, ramming the point to the floor. We accept your charge. As you cannot walk, we will walk for you and do as you ask, in the hope that you may be granted some measure of peace. Thomasina placed her hand on Philip's. Come, let us do what we came to do. That's the spirit, you two. Let's go, Sarah said. They placed Lady Chrysania's parts back in the box. Philip replaced the lid and tucked the box under his arm. At the end of the room was a stair heading up to a mezzanine. Go up the stairs, Sarah said. King fluttered up ahead of them. In his pool-like sight, rows of dusty re rectangular machinery and vine-like runs of tangled cabling emerged, looking like the darkened skyline of a mirthless city of the damned. These are life support systems Queen Gome used to use. Pretty old tech, if I say so myself. Don't trip on the cables. A dim white light came on at the far end of the mezzanine. Through there. Keep going. Making their way across the mezzanine, they found a modern hermetic door shut tight against the old stone. Through the window, they saw a long corridor heading down. I think I can open it. Just a moment, Sarah said. Got it. The door opened with a hiss and slid out of the way. King flew into the corridor as they followed, the two whispers merrily buzzing around their heads. Where are we going, Sarah? Thomasina asked. It's not far. You'll see. A word of caution. We're leaving the upper levels of Castle Bloodstein and entering the lower areas. We're getting near to the Gellertron. 
Kai said Gomes Manx might be running around down there, so keep your eyes peeled, mind your whispers, and stay out of King's way. Let him do work. They reached the end of the corridor. A heavy stone door awaited them. Thomasina felt the surface of the door. It was stony and solid, featuring a dramatic old-style knocker. A leering dragon face forged with a crooked smile and a heavy iron ring held in its teeth. Victims approach. The dragon knocker seemed to say, Must we enter? Thomasina asked. I don't like the feel of this. We need to pass through the door into the next chamber. It's probably locked or rusted shut, Sarah said. Can't help. Philip tried the door and sure enough it was stuck in place. They stood back and King went to work on the door, hitting it at high speed over and over like a jackhammer, chipping away, the knocker vibrating. Victims, victims, more victims, the knocker chided. King eventually made a small hole in the door's stone face. Cold, musty air drifted out. Someone's talking in there, Thomasina said. Do you hear? I hear no talking, King replied, his feathers coated with coarse dust. Philip stuffed his sap through the hole and formed it into a stout lever. Together, he and Thomasina pulled the door open. <sighs> Victims, come in. Join us. Inside was a dark vault-like room with a stony circular table placed at the center, taking up most of the space. Crude stone chairs draped with gangly tube-like machinery and dangling hoses tipped with heavy barbs were arranged around the table at irregular intervals. Be seated and never stand again. Philip and Thomasina walked in. At once, the room had a horrid feel to it, an oppressive chill, a diabolical, hopeless weight that dragged on one's soul, pulling it into the earth. Thomasina cringed. This place is cursed, she said, breathless, barely able to speak. I feel the hand of the dead reaching for our throats. The whispers didn't seem to want to come into the room. They lingered outside the door. Philip gently snatched them out of the air and held them in his palm. He pulled his poltava and stepped in, protecting Thomasina. Has a dankness about it, Rose, that's for certain. It's just RF or something, and our bodies are reacting. This is the wailing room, Sarah said, voice scratchy, the transponder popping. This is where Queen Gome once put her victims. She would seat them in these chairs and keep them alive with machinery. Lots of suffering. Lots of bad things happened here. Lots of people going mad in the wreckage of bad dreams. I guess I sat in one of these chairs not long ago. Faith was blank. So did Sam and Kai before we were wandered off to the hospital towers on Oban. My boy Rawl came to get me. I would doubt if this place is haunted or cursed or whatever you want to call it. On the other side of the room is another door. Go through it. Hurry up. Be careful. There was a door across an impossible gulf of the room. It seemed a long way off. The room was littered with shadows. Philip opened his sight momentarily. Images of hunched, faceless figures appeared, all sitting in the chairs under coarse, thready robes, all hooked up to the machinery. The barbs plunged into their flesh, all in incalculable suffering. See us! See us! They cried to him. The fact that one of these poor souls could have been Sarah, his sister, or Sam, or Magistrate Kylos, all people he loved, was too much for him. He shut his sight down. He didn't want to see. Rose, can you fly us across? She stood there, hugging herself. Rose? He took Thomasina and led her around the edge of the table towards the small door at the other side. It was difficult going. The table took up most of the available space. Its rough stony surface caught at their clothes with invisible hands, and the floor was treacherous with unseen rises and falls. The chairs themselves were vile obstructions. It was impossible to take a clean step without stumbling on something. There is someone sitting in that chair, Thomasina said, pointing, an edge of panic in her voice, something unheard of for the normally courageous woman from Wham. She fell into Philip's embrace. There's nobody here but the three of us, King replied. Machinery clinked and a set of barbed hoses slid off the table to the floor, making a rude amount of noise in the process. King snapped his sight on, illuminating nothing but rising dust. Sarah! Philip cried. Give us your dreams. Came through the transponder. We shall take those too. 
Philip, we must be away from here, Thomasina said. Philip pressed on, moving past the table. He nearly tripped on something bunched up on the floor. He kicked it aside. It was an empty, rather shapeless robe made of rough threads carelessly loomed together. Sarah wore that robe. They all arrived at the door. Philip fumbled with the latch, struggling to get it open. Another set of hoses slid off the floor. Machinery hissed. Rough fabric rustled. He got the door open, quickly shuffling Thomasina and himself through, eager to be gone. King following him. Your dreams. Came in a female voice from the transponder. Sarah? Philip asked. What? Came her usual voice. We're out. Thank creation, we're out. Philip shut the door. As soon as it closed, the latch moved as if something on the other side was trying to open the door. He held it shut, the latch shaking. Soon it faded, the latch settling into stillness. And with that, we complete part three, chapter two. I am Chrysania. A lot happened in that chapter. They arrived at abandoned creepy castle Bloodstein. They discover that the servant they had been speaking to in the previous book was actually just a crude robot that somebody was operating from remote. Probably Queen Gom or one of her servants. I really don't know. I never really put any thought to it. I just thought it was a kind of a horror. This is sort of a horror-based part of the book. I thought that kind of lent to the horror. Servant appeared to be just a, a funky robot. So I had written myself into a corner with these crazy minks that we'll be encountering in the next chapter. They're way too tough. And Philip and Thomasina just by themselves will not survive. So I gave them King. In my original draft, King sort of vanished from the story. He was done. He had served his purpose. He was just hanging out at Hoban for the rest of the story. You really didn't see him again. But I'm like, damn it. I need to give Philip and Thomasina some sort of an edge or they're dead. Nobody would, it wouldn't be a credible to the story if they managed to get through this without some help. So I gave them King. I had him wing his way back from Hoban to Castle Bloodstein and, and wait for them there. Otherwise, they'd be dead meat. You gotta do things like that. So you gotta roll with the punches. You gotta adjust for the unexpected. And even though you're the one creating this stuff, sometimes things just sort of happen on their own. You just have to go with it. So yeah, okay. I will give them king it works out pretty well just to have king sort of just disappear from the narrative would have been weird so this way he gets an active role in the the last part of the book which is good concerning chrysania i didn't really intend for there to be a lady chrysania i fully intended that it was queen gome the entire time just pretending to be lady chrysania that she was the one duping them and so forth in fact some of the the writing some of the references she makes especially when talking about sam and how strong Sam was is actually Gom, you know, admiring Sam's strength. But characters evolve as the work in progress continues. They they change and sometimes on their own and you just have to go with it. And after a while, it came to me that Gom would be a much better villain if she was like just a manifestation of a, of a terrified, desperate woman, Lady Chrysania, captured by the sisters for God knows how long long imprisoned in the dark tower of Valenhelm, desperate wanting out even though she could her door was unlocked she could just walk out if she wanted she was too meek to do that the sister said do not leave and so she wasn't gonna leave so in her misery she invented the persona of queen gom a ruthless sociopath who could get her out of Valenhelm, and she did but then imprisoned chrysania within the depths of her own mind unable to gain access to to the real world except when Gome lets her and I you know hadn't that was all just kind of happened organically I hadn't planned that in the story but then you get this scene here where Chrysania for once asserts herself you know she says I am Chrysania that's a bold statement that's like this is who I am and for at least a fleeting few moments however long it lasted she was herself and she was able to scrawl on this table a message that she didn't know if anyone that would ever find or not but she was hoping that the Blanchfords would return and they would assist her in some way and she's offering them the control column to the bower chest if you can control that you can control much of 
Queen Gom's fortune. Much of her Geller powers come from the Bower chest. And that she enchanted the handle to lead them through the Gellertron. And we will get to the Gellertron in the next chapter. I had kind of an emotional attachment to Lady Chrysania. You know, that little message she wrote in the table was pretty lengthy, but I, I felt it needed to have a lot of information in it, and, and it did. So next chapter we will actually delve deep into the depths of castle bloodstein and encounter this gellertron that i've been talking about for two chapters now part three chapter three the blood box and we'll see how philip thomasina and king fare against the demons of queen gome the manx and it's not gonna be pretty in any event this is ren presents i am your host ren Peace out.